All right, well, we are ready to start on a new journey, um, mainly through um, a study of 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, which um, last episode I told you was a sermon series that I did on the second Sundays of the month um, back in 2021 and 2022. Uh, but before going into that, like I said last time, um, I wanted to share a sermon with you that I preached in January of 2021 that kind of got me thinking into going into that series later on that year um, from Hebrews 10 verses 24 and 25. And remember uh, that the context um, on that was the whole thing uh, surrounding COVID and how that affected um, the church just in general um, of getting together and meeting together and how Hebrews 20, uh, 10, 25 was kind of a verse that was uh, that was used to uh, promote the whole thing of, hey, we need to we need to continue to meet together. And, you know, even though some people are saying that we shouldn't. Um, and while I agree with that uh, line of application, um, just also wondering at the same time if people truly had a, had, had an understanding of what that what that verse was driving at um, and were people looking at it solely as an application point to attend a service uh, or was it something much deeper and my whole point is that it means something much deeper and much more um, much more intimate just as far as getting together is concerned and um, and spurring one another on towards love and good deeds so um, that's the whole heart surrounding the message and why I preach from that from that passage so again just to remind you the context of it because a lot of things that are mentioned in that sermon, uh, sermon are you know are COVID related, and I mention all that th that stuff, so it's important for you to to know that uh, going in. Um, but COVID or no COVID, I mean, it's it's still um, a relevant uh, message, and I hope that uh, um, that uh, that it serves as something that's instructive and profitable for you. So, um, before going into uh, the sermon, uh, let me just. Uh, uh, tell you that um, if you enjoy the show and you uh, haven't done so already, I would encourage you to subscribe to my show on Apple Podcasts, also on iHeartRadio, YouTube, or Spotify. Uh, you can also follow me, uh, Steve Gill, on X. Uh, the handle is at LT Scripts. That's L T S E R I T P T S, which stands for Loving the Scriptures, and my all uh, my other account at LT Scripts Pod. That's L T S E R I P T S P O D. Um, and also, uh, don't forget to order a copy of my book if you haven't done so already, Signs of the End, What Did Jesus Say About His Own Return and the Events That Point to It. It's a uh, book that, uh, uh, that examines the Olivet Discourse and Jesus answers the disciples' questions about when will be the, what will be the signs of his coming and of the end of the age. So um, if you're uh, curious about eschatology, if you're into eschatology and uh, talk about last things. This might be a book that uh, you might find interesting. Um, Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com are a couple of places where you can order a copy of that book. I'll leave a link in the episode description, so it'll take you right there. And um, yeah, I hope you order a copy. I, I strongly encourage you to, to order a copy of that book. Read it and be blessed. Okay, so without any further ado, um, I will go ahead and transition you into the sermon. I hope you enjoy it. My name is Steve Gill, and you're listening to Loving the Scriptures. Well, if you have a Bible... Uh, go ahead and open up to Hebrews chapter 10. And here's what I want to do. Um, I'm, my focus is going to be on um, verses uh, 24 and 25. But what I want to do is I want to read from verse 19 all the way through that passage, just so we can have a, a fuller, you know, just kind of in our minds, uh, somewhat of a context. Hopefully that'll help us to uh, to anchor our minds on, on what the writer of Hebrews um, is saying here. Um, in these verses that, that precede verses 24 and 25, um, there, is, there is so much there. And it pains me as, as a preacher of God's word to, you know, just kind of not really be able to touch on those things um, as much as I would like to. Um, one might think that maybe I could have had the opportunity last week, since I taught last week too, um, it, I didn't even 
think I was going to be te teaching on Hebrews when we did that. Plus, uh, I was told last week that the message that I had on fear and faith was very timely, so I think God was, God was behind that, so um, no regrets there. But um, um, So I want to just read uh, verses, from verses 19 through 25 so we can get that, that whole picture. And even with that, we're not really getting you know, the, the full story here, obviously, but, you know, hopefully this will help. So in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 and following, it says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, uh, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith that our... With our excuse me, uh, full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. Now here it is, here's our, here's our verses here. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day, see the day drawing near. And I suppose it's that verse 25 really is the, is the verse, I think, that a lot of us are, are really familiar with. Um, and in fact, that verse about not neglecting the meeting together, not forsaking this assembly of ourselves, you know, we, we hear that verse. That, I don't think that's an obscure verse. I think people have, have recited it from time to time. But especially now, in this day and age, you hear it more and more because of the current situation. Um, with coronavirus that happened uh, and is still happening and, um, you know, the whole thing of, of churches closing down, uh, whether voluntarily or with, with by government uh, decree, or, you know, which depending on where people live or whatever, you know, there's this whole thing of, well, should we get to getting back together and uh, meeting together again? Because, as scripture says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves. Don't neglect meeting together. And so that's, that's, the, that's kind of the go-to verse that, that, that you have when it comes to that sort of conversation. And especially for people who maybe uh, have been ordered by government to shut down and you have people who are questioning, you know, I think I'm going to go against this. You have that, you know, you may have remembered, you know, everything with John MacArthur. I haven't been keeping up lately on what's going on, but you remember you know, he's, his church is opened up again, even though he's not allowed to. Um, and, you know, people look at that and admire that, and they say, well, that's, that's right in line with, with Hebrews, Hebrews 10. Don't, don't, uh, don't neglect the assembling of yourselves together. So again, over and over again, when it comes to that conversation, that's, that's the go-to verse. That's what, you, that's what you hear. And that is correct. That is, that is a, a, a verse that is rightly applied to that situation. Here's my, here's my thought, though, and here's my question. Do we, even in that, even in that, though, do we as Christians get a full grasp of what the writer of Hebrews is actually trying to say? I wonder, for many people who quote this verse, when they say, well, you know, don't, don't forsake the, the meeting together, the assembling of ourselves, do they equate it to don't neglect attending a service? You see what I'm saying there? Because, and the reason why I think I can legitimately ask this question is because I've heard so many people in different conversations and just how they refer to the worship service and everything about the worship service and everything that they enjoy about the worship service. Everything is about the service. Now, again, there's nothing wrong with the service. There's nothing wrong with, with an organized sort of service. There's nothing wrong with having an order of worship and everything like that. I'm not, I, please understand that what I'm saying isn't, isn't to criticize anything of that, but it's the way that maybe a lot of us sometimes come into this time on Sundays and, uh, we, and we say, okay, we're gathering together as a, as a body of believers, which we are, but, and we say that, and we say that that's a fulfillment of, uh, or obedience to Hebrews 10.25. And it is, but again, I think the idea is, are we just looking at it more of assembling together to attend a service? If it is, 
if that is, then even in that, we have the application right as it relates to everything that's going on, but even with that mindset, we still fall short of what actually is being meant when the writer of Hebrews says, don't neglect the assembling of yourselves together. There's still something missing. Um, you know, because there's, there's something that's very, that's very personal in the whole thing of, of, gathering, of gathering together. And if, if our only focus is on attending a service, then we miss that huge element of the personal nature of what it means for us to gather together as a group, as a body of believers. So if anything, this morning is, is designed to give us the why. Why, is, why. why does it say, why does scripture say that we aren't to neglect meeting together, okay? And I can tell you that it's more what's being talked about and what's being laid out, what's being suggested is more than just attending a service. Just to give you an idea of, of why I, I think along these lines is that um, when everything with COVID-19 and the pandemic first kind of reared its ugly head, you know, we, we didn't know really what was going on. We, it was still, still a lot of it was kind of a mystery out of safety and things, people were, were closing their doors to church. Some people were, we couldn't meet because we didn't have this building because the building closed down, right? So that was, you know, we had, had all those things going on. And uh, from a few people, you know, I, I heard this whole thing of, you know, okay, I, I'm not able to go to church and, you know, we don't have any sort of streaming or anything like that. So, what I did was I tuned into this church's uh, live stream, or I I heard that this church was was having a was was having their thing online, so I was able to get on there and ha and see their service online. Which, by the way, that's I'm not criticizing that. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, nobody's be nobody's sinning, doing any harm or anything like that by 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 looking at somebody else's church's live stream. But here's the thing. The way that it's approached is this is a substitute from where I usually go to church. And it's not so much seen as, you know, I'm not able to meet together with my church because they're closed down or they don't have live stream, they don't have that, that option, that sort of thing. It's this is a substitute for the service that I usually attend over here. Am I making sense here? Do you, you see where I'm coming from? And so the whole element of meeting together, I think, in a lot of people's minds equates to, well, I just attend a service. And, and let me tell you, when it comes to meeting together, it, it, meeting together and, and following through with what this, this, this passage says, it's more than just attending a service, okay? And so I don't want us to miss out on the, on the richness of what's being communicated here. So what I want to do, you know, and just looking at this here, I want to start, I want to start actually in verse 25. I know that it said verse 24 and verse 25, but I want to start in verse 25. And in my Bible here, my translation, is, it's starting in mid-sentence here. Uh, talking about this, where it's talking about not neglecting to meet together, okay? Now, I'm going to get a little bit, uh, I, don't, I don't know if nitpicky is the right word. I'm not being nitpicky. I'm just, I'm just trying to focus our attention on how the wording is, is presented to us in this passage. Do you notice that it doesn't say, thou shalt meet together, it says that you are not to neglect the meeting together. Now, I, again, I'm not trying to be nitpicky because it's just two ways of saying the same thing. So I understand that. But it's just interesting how that verse is worded as it's being presented to us. Not neglecting the assembling of yourselves. Not neglecting the meeting together of one another. Okay, Which gives us this idea that there's a, there's a temptation... And I'm sure that a lot of us have felt this temptation at one, to one degree or another at certain points in our lives where you, you were, there's this whole thing of, well, I don't really want to go to church today for whatever reason. It's cold outside. Uh, you know, I, it, I, I would rather stay home and watch ESPN. You know, whatever the, whatever the case may be, you know, it's the whole thing. You, you have this whole thing of people not you know, not coming together and meeting with other people and staying behind, staying home, doing whatever, for whatever reason. 
You know, so that's what that's what that's the aim of, of what's being talked about here. The aim is is talk is not just not simply saying this is what you are to do, but it's saying make sure that you don't neglect this, which also might suggest that there's a there's a there's a point in a time when we were getting together, we were fellowshipping, we were we were uh, encouraging one another and gaining uh, and, and showing love and encouragement and all that to with one another, but we started to back off a little bit, and then. One week ended up turning into two weeks, three weeks, several weeks, and whatever the case may be. And you get that sense even more in that, in that verse where it says in verse 25, as is the habit of some. Now, in the immediate context there of the book of Hebrews, you, you could have a, a couple of explanations here and there. I think one of the big ones uh, of what you might be talking about as it relates to the Hebrew audience that the writer is writing to is that th this these churches, this Hebrew church was going through some very difficult times, um, some, some persecution, not heavy persecution that a lot of other people are used to. The writer of Hebrews would say, would also say in the same letter that, you know, you haven't suffered to the point of shedding your own blood. So it wasn't to that degree, but they were feeling pressure of some sort. Um, you had that, plus you had people who were discouraged because these are people who knew and understood and were taught about the, the, the glory of the upcoming uh, 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 second coming of Christ, and you have that blessed hope, but then you have all of these pressures coming on at the same time, and that, that's, that served as a, as a great setup for discouragement. Plus, even in, and added along that, you had people who weren't really sure about how to deal with all of this, and so they thought maybe the whole thing of, of getting right with God again and taking care of post-conversion sins. Maybe I just need to go back and do what I did before in the Judaistic system and, and start offering sacrifices and things like that. There was, we're dealing with a, with a group of people that was, that was just, they were, they were struggling. It was a real struggle. And as, and as part of that struggle, as part of the manifestation of that struggle, one of the things may have been, you know, what's, why, why, why assemble together? Why, what's the point of this? Just this, this sense of discouragement, maybe fear. I continue to meet with these people. It's just going to invite more persecution for people on the outside. You know, you could have that or a wide range of things that are going on. But the thing is, he says, don't neglect the coming together of yourselves, as is the habit of some. Now, we think of habit, and we think of something that's perpetual. We think of something that's a pattern, right? So... We're not talking, let's, let's get something straight here. We're not talking about if you attend, if you, if we come together here on a Sunday morning and then like on one, you miss a Sunday or something like that, you know, we're, we're not, we're not going to hound you. We're not going to, we're not going to beat you up. We're not going to do anything. Some people might, some people go on vacation. Some people go camping. That's fine. Sometimes I wish I could go with you. Um, but I mean, that's th just the reality, you know, and, and, we understand and we know, and so it's not a matter of somebody misses a Sunday and we immediately call them up and say, why didn't you come to church on Sunday? That's not really what we're, what we're talking about, but we're talking about something where it's a habit of, you know, it, for whatever reason, they're just not coming. And again, when I, when I talk about not coming, what I'm talking about and what the writer is talking about is more than just attending a service, okay? And repeat that more than once over and over again this morning as we as we go through this here and I, hopefully as you as you see this passage you, you'll you'll get the sense of why that is uh, so it's it's a matter of, of of pattern and a habit now listen even with people who are who have a pattern of not assembling with other believers we understand that there are certain situations or certain circumstances where that pattern is actually legitimate. It's, it's hard for them to, you know, meet together every week, you know, with believers because of certain life circumstances or even with physical ailments and things like that. We understand that that's not even, that's not even the, the, the issue at hand here. Um, but what the writer of Hebrews is talking about here is a habit, a pattern of, of things that are, that are going on there. And so what the writer is, is saying is saying, don't get sucked into that whole thing of what other people are doing. They're not where they need to be, but you also don't follow that pattern as well. Because here's the thing. The whole thing of meeting together, this is, good. This is something that for a lot of people may sound so 
I don't know if radical is the right word, but I mean, maybe. But this is, this is the whole thing about some, this that might be so radical. When it came to meeting together as a group, as a body of believers, it was something where everybody had the opportunity to participate, right? Everybody had, a, had, had an opportunity to participate in the lives of one another. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is, is trying to get at there. So I wanted to, to lay that, that groundwork of just what the, what the writer is saying there in verse 25. Of he's talking about not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. But I also want to take that and then go back to what we, what we see here in verse 24. Okay, and then come back to what's said later in, in verse 25. So we're just, we're kind of dealing with the sandwich. I just, I just dealt with the meat there. Now we're going to, now we're going to address the two pieces of bread. Okay, <laughs> as silly as that sounds, that's, that's what, that's what we're aiming for. So don't neglect the meeting together, uh, 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 or the assembling together, but go back to verse 24. It says, and let us consider how to stir up, uh, to stir up one another to love and good works, okay? Now, here's the thing. The question might be asked, okay, stir one another up to love and good works. Well, what love and good works? What does that look like? I don't know. He doesn't, he doesn't give any sort of indication of specifics or details there, but he says, consider, let us, um, let us consider how to stir up one another. This is something that we should be considering. This is something that we should be thinking about. This is something that we should be contemplating on how to stir one another up towards love and good deeds. And, and the fact that there's no specifics or details on, on this, I think, are very interesting. As we're being called to consider these things, I think it's, it, it leaves wide open the door to allow the Holy Spirit to come in and to lead and to guide us to that, to that end. Now, we want those, whatever it is to, you know, that we're being led to do, to be biblical, and obviously it will be if the Spirit is leading in that direction. But I think that that leaves open this, this opportunity for the Spirit to come in uh, and to work and to do these things so that we can stir one another up towards love and good deeds and so that we can, uh, and, and so that we can encourage uh, each other on that, uh, towards that end. Now, you'll notice here, and if your translation is like mine, verse 24, as it goes into verse 25, we're still dealing with the same sentence. So if we take verse 24 and read into verse 25, it says, let us consider how to stir up one, stir up one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, da 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 right? So I, th- I think it's, this is the, the writer's way of saying, okay, let's, let's consider how we, can stir, how we can stir up one another uh, towards love and good deeds, not on the opposite end, neglecting to meet together, as some are in the habit of doing, right? So you, so you see the, the, the carry-through of what the, of what the writer is trying to say there. So what we can pick up from that is that we're hearing the writer say that whatever those love and good deeds are that we want to stir up one another to, or how we want to model that, how we want to speak, uh, how we even demonstrate love, and how we even uh, um, uh, initiate good works to other people too, I think all that can be included in there as well. The best way that that can happen is when we are together when we are together as a group and as a body of believers. And so what we see there is something where the body of Christ, in whatever, in whatever way, in whatever form, because again, it's, the specifics aren't given there as, as to how we stir one another up to, lo- to love and good deeds. The writer says, consider how you can do that. But whatever that looks like, and whatever that form that takes, whatever the, however way the Holy Spirit leads you to do those things, the best way that that can happen and the best time that that can happen and the best environment that that can take place is when we are together as a body of believers. And that's what he's, get, and that's what he's getting at there. Okay? So, you know, it's, it's very interesting because um, we think about this, uh, you know, just a lot of the things that we can... That we can um, that we, can, that we can gain for ourselves just being in, a, in one another's midst. And looking at this, what we have here as something that is 
uh, that is more than just this, just a service. We have a service, right? We have a, we have a service. We have we have worship. We have uh, um, a time of, of worship and singing. We have a time of of uh, you know being in the Word and 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 teaching from the Word and learning from uh, what the Lord has to say through His Word. But there are so many other things, and I think that we can miss this sometimes. There are so many other things that can happen still as we're together, but outside of the service time where, all, where these sorts of things can, can take place. And we can miss it to a degree that even, even when we miss it, though, we can still be active in the way that God has laid out for us, and we don't even know it. We don't, we don't realize how God could be using us uh, during certain times when we're together to reach somebody else or to touch somebody else's life or to demonstrate love to somebody else, Okay. And so it's those sorts of things that I think that it's important for us to be very cognizant of and seeing how God can work in our midst even outside of the service time. Let me give you an example of what I, of what I mean and what I'm talking about here. Um, there was, this was probably, probably a couple of years ago, at least, um, where I was on my way here Sunday morning. Um, and I was driving, I was driving here, and I was, I don't remember specifically what was going on in my life, but I remember that I was very spiritually and emotionally frustrated. I was not in a good place. And um, I'm driving here, I'm kind of in this blah sort of thing, and at the same time, I'm thinking, okay, I'm on my way to church, um, and I don't want to come into this time like this. And it's very hard for me to shake where I am right now. I am so frustrated right now. I'm just praying as I'm driving on, the, on my way here. I'm like, Good, Lord, you're going to have to do something. Because I don't want to come in here with this attitude and then bring other people down. That's not, that's not going to serve any purpose of glorifying you or whatever. So I don't know what you're going to do, Lord. But in whatever way, please help me between now and when I enter those doors. So I pull up in the back there where I, where I usually used to park, was coming, in, was coming into the doors there, and uh, right there at the, at the doors there was, was Al Siebert. And, uh, you know, Al, big old smile on his face, and in a very jolly way, told me good morning, brought me in, gave me a nice tight squeeze. And it's just amazing how that one thing just kind of melted everything that I was feeling at that moment. Now, we, I know Al, and you all know Al. Al's kind of like that. But behind that, you know what I think? I think, I think that was the Lord recruiting Al, unbeknownst to him. I let him know about it later on, like a few months later. I said, I don't know if you know that the Lord used you in a very profound way. I, I think that the Lord was using Al at that time to answer my prayer which I wouldn't have gotten if I was an attendee at Bedside Baptist. Because listen, when you're in a mood like that, do you, maybe, you're, maybe you're not like me. Everybody's not like me. Um, that's a mistake on your part, but uh, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Um, not everybody's like me, but, but, but with me sometimes, if I'm, in one of the, if I'm in that place, the last thing I want to do is be around people. I want, to, I want to go away somewhere else. I want to be by myself. So being an attendee at Bedside Baptist would have been the perfect thing for me to do at that time. If I hadn't been here, and even before walking through the door, being exposed to God using Al with a simple hug and a big smile, I mean, it was, it was I mean, I know the story doesn't sound like that big of a deal, it, 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 and it's kind of hard to put into words. When he wrapped me up and he gave me that hug, it's, it, it, was, it was kind of like an inward melting sort of thing. It was just like all just went. Getting, getting a nice hug from, from my brother in Christ who was happy to see me there. And, I, and again, I look back on that now and I think that God used Al to be able to do that. I'm not going to get that if I, if I neglect to be here. You see, and again, I don't. You know, at that time, Al didn't didn't know or didn't understand that God was using him in a in a very big way, in a, in a very nice way. And so that prompts me 
when I come, and when I come here and I see how God worked just a few minutes ago, changes my attitude on how I approach everybody else in this room. And now I, my, the fear isn't there anymore where I bring other people down because of my nasty attitude. Now the joy that I have because I got to see God work passes off to other people. And again, you can't get that if you attend Bedside Baptist over and over and over again. See how that works? And so that's one of the things, even outside of the service time, where we're able to participate in things like that. Again, sometimes not knowingly, sometimes knowingly, but sometimes not knowingly. And we miss out on those things if we don't follow through with what we have here, where he says, don't neglect the you don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. There's a very personal meaning behind that as we're talking about a community of people. And you know what? Here's, here's, the, here's, the, here's the challenging thing just as it relates to our society, the, the society that we live in right now. And I obviously include myself in this society. I, I see it in myself so many times. But we are, we're, very, we're a very individualistic culture. In other places in the world, community means everything, both inside and outside the church, but especially in the church and other places of the world. But it's just, it's just as the way our culture is, it's very, it's, very, it's very individual, which is why sometimes when you look at Scripture and you see some of the, some of the, the commands that are given in, the, in Scripture and particularly in the New Testament, you realize that, some, that a lot of those things that are commanded have a community context to it but we individualize it. We say, this is, this, okay, this is how, this is, this is what I am supposed to do. Well, yes, individually, yes, you are, but you realize that this was written to a community, and as a community, is saying you folks together are supposed to put this into practice. And that's why this is somewhat challenging to a, in, a, in a culture like ours. It's not, it's not necessarily easy to shake, but community is so important. So, you know, it, it, it can be very easy for us to, when we don't have that community context, to fall into this situation where we, you know, slowly start in a pattern of, you know, not assembling together, not coming together, and that sort of thing. And what's especially challenging now is that, you see, this is, this is the good side and the bad side of, of technology. Because the good side of technology is during this time, in the, you know, with everything that we've dealt with, with coronavirus and everything, technology has provided us with an opportunity to stream to people who aren't able to, who aren't able to be here. You know, um, you know they, might, they might, you know, enjoy uh, Mark's preaching, but they're not able to make it. But there, there's a way, there's an avenue for, you know, to still get the message that, that the Lord leads Mark to preach or, and that sort of thing. Um, but at the same time, and this is something that, that other churches, they have experienced this as well. Where we are right now, and even with people who have, be, have opened up their doors again, you have some people who do come back, but then you have other people who don't come back, and then they, you said, that's just, that's just a struggle that we've had, is that, you know, we, you know, some people just won't come back. Because what they can do is they can just, they can just get it on the live stream, and that's the whole thing of, well, what, and this could be a question that people ask in their mind. I don't know if they ask it or not, but they can ask the question, why do I need to go to the actual place when I can get it right here on my computer? See what I'm saying? And so there, there again is the whole thing. It's about attending a service, but it's more than just attending a service. Yes, granted, true that, that people who are who have a live, who, who attend the live stream, um, they, you know, they can get, uh, to a large degree, everything that we do if we come here physically, the music, the teaching, and everything like that. But if that's the only thing that we're looking at this through, if that's the only, if that's the only way that we're seeing this is that, well, it's kind of the same thing because it's the service, then we've missed the point. We've missed the point entirely. And so that's the challenge that a lot of churches are facing right now. And when people approach the, the, the whole thing of, of, of you know, what this is all about, they miss out on what God really has in store for his people 
as a community. And, and dare I say, it's outside of God's will. It is. It's outside of God's will for that to happen. God has a specific plan, a specific purpose as it relates to us on a continual basis meeting together. And again, I'm not saying, I'm not saying, I'm excluding people where actually they can't for reasons A, B, C, or D. And we, you know, it, I understand that. Um, but this is, this is, you know, we miss something here. And again, this is what, what, the, what the writer of Hebrews lays out there. So he's saying that when it comes to meeting together, that's the best time, the best place where the whole thing of, of, um, of, uh, of, of stirring one another up towards love and good deeds can happen. Now, I will hasten to say where it's not just limited to a Sunday morning. Can it happen in other contexts outside of a Sunday morning? Yes, but I think that, the, that Scripture does hint at the idea of a corporate gathering as we have right now, you know, where we come together as a corporate body to worship and everything like that. And it wasn't so much service as we understand it back then. You know, that's why, that's why I want to I stress this whole thing. But when it comes to us, we're talking about something that's more than just, you know, just a, a, service, a service type thing. All right? So in that, in that environment of, of not neglecting to meet one another, we're in a better position to stir one another on uh, to love and good deeds. But not only that, let's get to the bottom part of the bun, the, the bottom part of the sandwich, okay? We got, the, we got the top bread, we got the meat, now let's get to the bottom part of it here. So again, in verse 25, it says, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day, as you see the day drawing near. So that last part there, I want to take this in two parts, okay? So it says, but encouraging one another. And I don't think that that's miles, miles apart in difference as, uh, in, uh, as to you know, what the writer may have been trying to get at in verse 24. But again, it, it just kind of lays out again the reality of how much this is a participatory thing that everybody can be involved in. Again, whether knowingly or unknowingly, you know, who knows? But, uh, you know, that's, you know, this is why, this is why I, I love the fact or that before service, you ever notice before our time here, you know, I was even just kind of looking at it this morning. I, I noticed Pam and, you know, just your, the chair turn and you just kind of interacting with, uh, with people there. And sometimes when I see you, Chris, and, and Amanda and people, you know, just up here, even outside of practice, you're just kind of, just kind of interacting and stuff. I mean, and I'm sure the topic of conversation is various and everything, but, you know, our, our service time starts, or at least, you know, what we've deemed it to be, is 10.30. You ever notice that we rarely, we rarely start at 10.30? Um, just before here, when we were, when we were uh, whenever you're ready to start, I said whenever you're ready to start, so in about five minutes or so, and it was like 10.29. Now, some people might have a problem that we don't get started right at 10.30 because in their mind, that's when church starts. But I look around, I was like, church has already started, folks. It's already started right here. And you know what? It happens even after the service. I can tell you, I want to share with you, just from my own personal experience, over the past couple of, couple of months, it's been amazing how God has set up situations where even after the service, church continues. Now, I use that, I use that term, I use, I use those terms deliberately. Service has ended, church continued. I've gotten into very good discussions with people after their service about the things of God. And you know what? I walk out of those times encouraged. Encourage one another? Yeah. Those are great times to encourage one another. And specifically even, um, I think it was the Sunday after, after Jonathan and Amanda's wedding, that Sunday when Mark's family was here. I remember we had, a, we had a great time after the service, but church continuing, where we were just talking about the things of God as it related to what I had spoken on in the sermon there, and we just kind of delved in a little bit deeper to talk about those things. I said, man, that's, that's, just a, that's just a wonderful thing, and it was organic. It wasn't anything that was, that was structured or anything. It was, it was great. It was, just, it was just something that just happened, 
And that's happened on two or three other occasions after this time here, which I wouldn't have gotten if I wasn't here. Now, to be fair, I had to be here with the one where Mark's family was here because I was preaching that Sunday. But, <laughs> but <laughs> in all fairness, but, but the point is, though, is that we miss out on those things where we can actually be encouraging one another. And I might be encouraging them in that whole thing as well. Okay? And that's, and that's the whole thing that, uh, that, we, that we have going on there. Now, we look at a, at, a, at a gathering like ours. We're a very small group, and we think that, man, this, it would be very easy for that sort of thing to happen, for that sort of thing to take place, to, in, encourage, uh, to encourage each other with this small group. How do people in larger churches deal with stuff like that? And I think that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a valid question. Um, I think that there are other things that are put in place other than the large worship gathering where those things can happen. But I would submit to you that even in larger congregations, this isn't anything that's, that's absent, that the potential of encouraging one another outside of the service is still there. Now, let me, now let me, let me tell you this story. And this is, this is a story about what potentially could have happened. And I say potentially because it didn't happen, sadly. But this was back when I was in Kansas, and the church that I was going to was, was larger. It, it had maybe two or 300 people. And um, after, a particular, after a particular Sunday, I remember I was walking out. We met in a school, so we met in a gymnasium, kind of like this. The gym was a little bit bigger, and it fit a lot more people. But we were walking. I was walking out. And as I was walking this way, there was another woman coming the other way here, and we were just kind of, our paths just kind of were converging as we were making our way to this exit. Now, I didn't know this woman personally. I'd seen her several times, and we had maybe had brief interactions here and there in times just like this, where we're just kind of, our paths cross. Hey, how you doing? Hey, I'm doing great. Um, I didn't know her personally, but she, she had something about her. She, she was just a really nice person. Um, and so as we were, as we, as our paths were just kind of crossing, as we were both making our way to the exit, um, she said, "Man, that was that was quite a message today, wasn't it?" I said, "Yeah, it was a that was a really good message." And she said, "You know, it, it really it really spoke to me powerfully. And just given a lot of the things that I've been going through this week, to hear what he said, you know, you know, just really it really spoke to me, and God really used that to speak to me." And the thing that I wanted to ask but didn't was, well, can you share that? I, I would love to, to hear that. You know, what, you know, how, you know, can you open up a little bit more and just kind of tell me what that is? And I didn't. And so I thought later on, when I was by myself, I'm thinking, why didn't I ask her that? And I think the reason was is that I felt like I would, I would have been intrusive I think that's, I think that's, and again, that's, that's not surprising in, a, in an individualistic culture. You know, we, we don't want to get in, a, you know, any deeper than, you know, a lot of times just kind of some of the surfacey things. Anything beyond that, and we might be treading on inappropriate territory. At least that's what we think, and at least that's what I thought at that time. But I thought, you know what? There's a good possibility. Maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. I, I, can't, I couldn't have gotten inside of her head. But there's a good possibility that maybe me just being curious about what God was doing in her life would have served as a blessing to her. And maybe she would have been thrilled to death to tell me what God was doing. And in the process, that encourages me. And so we both missed out. Now, no fault of her own. But we both missed out on something that would, would have been potentially great. Where in that time... After the service, we would continue to have church. And continue to have church could be another five minutes, ten minutes, two minutes, whatever the case. And God may have very well have been the one that was orchestrating that whole thing to bring that together so that one or both people can be encouraged. You know, I don't think it's outside of the realm of possibility for God to use times like these, whether in a small group like ours or in larger, in larger assemblies. I mean, goodness, even, even Lincoln Berean. You might look at that and say, how can something like that happen there? I don't know if they're having services because of COVID or anything. I don't know what their whole deal is. But in a regular, you know, non-COVID environment, you might think, you know, can something like that happen? Sure, I wouldn't put limits on what God can do. 
before and after the service. And I think that, you know, because God knows us so well, and he knows what we need, just like he knew what I needed when I came through those doors a couple years ago and now came to meet me, the kind of things, the kind of encouragements that we, that we can get from other people and what we can do in encouraging other people. You see, the thing is, we might be serve as an encouragement to other people and we might not know it. And what's really helpful is that sometimes when somebody says, you know, when you did that, that was really, I was really encouraged. Wow, I didn't know that, but that's good to know because I know how people appreciate that kind of, that kind of encouragement. And so you have all these, all these things going on, and I, I think about that, and I think, man, if I'm not here, I miss out on that. And I miss out on what God might have intended specifically for me. That encouragement that might come to me, you know, in whatever way, in interacting with one, two, three, or four people, can be very much divinely planned. Whatever encouragement that, that might be, I might be the intended receiver of that. If I'm not here, I miss out. And I think that that's the idea that we have here, where we have the opportunity to encourage one another. And isn't it, and, and you, I'm sure that you all can, can speak to this and testify to this. Aren't you, aren't you encouraged up to the wazoo when you're hearing somebody talk about what God is doing and how they're working in their life? I don't know, I don't know about you. Again, like I said, you're, you all aren't like me, even though you should. And, you know, <laughs> no, kidding. Strike that from the record. But, but I mean, like, I, I, am, I am truly blessed when I hear that. You know another person who's kind of like that? My mom. My mom still is, still harps, not harps, that's not the right word, is still, she reminds me from time to time about something that I told her, like, from now ago, it was probably like a year ago, um, about how God miraculously it worked in some ways as far as, far as my fa- finances go, where bills that were, that were intended to be paid and that I was ready to pay, I didn't have to pay for whatever reason. I mean, it's just really mysteriously shocking sort of thing where, you know, she said, that's a blessing from God. And every once in a while when I'm talking to her on the phone, she says, I still can't get over that. And that blesses me so much. You know, my mom's like that. I'm kind of like that to a certain degree. Maybe some of you are like that, but we miss out on that if we're not around one another. And that's, and that's the thing. I know, I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll even mention here with, with Nancy, you're, you're very good at this. I love hearing, I love hearing what you're explaining what God does in your life. And it's wonderful. It encourages me. I want you to know that, okay? Um, it's, 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 it's truly a thing. So we're talking about something that's much more than a service here. We're talking about something that God has designed where we can, really, we can really be an encouragement to one another, where we can stir one another up towards love and good deeds, whatever that might look like, okay? It's interesting. It says there in verses 24 and, uh, and 25, one another. We talk about the one another's there. Um, yeah, in verse 24, let us, uh, let us consider how to stir up one another. Verse 25, but encouraging one another. See, that's where, the, that's where we get this whole thing of, of the one another's. And that means, and I've just alluded this to you as far as it relates to myself, that I, that I a pastor, can be encouraged by you. I don't want anybody in this room to ever think that we have our fill of encouragement because we're pastors. That's not true. I'm sure Mark can say that. I'm sure Jeremy can say that. You know, you, I mean, we, I mean, that's one, of, that's one of the greatest joys, at least for me, of being around you, is that you guys can encourage me. And so when we look at it as just a service, we look at it as, you know, I'm encouraged by the service, which is great, and I, and I don't want to take that away either. But that's the only lens that we look at it through, and the encouragement comes from pastors or people who are in who are in leadership, and that's not necessarily the case. You think about um, I want to read this to you, um, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter one, where uh, in Romans chapter one in uh, verse eleven where he says, "For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you." That is that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Now think about this. 
we think about the Apostle Paul, spiritual giant, wrote a good chunk of the New Testament. He was one who needed to be encouraged? Yeah. And he says, I'm looking for that from you guys. I remember when I was a, when I was a college student, I was involved in the, uh, when I was involved in the, um, um, the, the campus ministry that I was involved with as a, as a college student. There was, there was a period of time where I was meeting weekly with, with one of the staff. Uh, we'd meet every Friday morning. And one week, uh, there was a guy who had, came, had come in from town. He was there to speak to our, our, our larger group um, in that, in that uh, campus ministry. Um, and, you know, I, I'd only been exposed to him then and for the first time and just hearing him speak. You hear him speak, you think, wow, this guy seems like a real big spiritual giant. He knows scripture, you know, everything like that and, and everything. Well, he was staying at the house of the guy that I met with every week. And he didn't cancel us meeting together. He just brought him with him when we, when we met in our usual spot every Friday, when we, were, we would meet every Friday morning. So it was the three of us, me, the guy that I, that I was meeting with on staff, and then this guy who had been the guest speaker the previous night. And so we talked about a variety of things. And uh, when we were done, when we were getting ready to, 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 call, it a, to call it quits there, the, the guy said, the guy that uh, was the guest, he said, he said, well, Steve, it was really a pleasure meeting you, and I want to tell you that I, you've truly encouraged me. I thought, wait, I, I encouraged you? That's, how's, did I, did I? You're, you're the, you're the big dude. You're, you know a lot of scripture. I don't really don't know a lot. And like, what, how did it, no, he said he was encouraged. Him, encouraged by me. It happens. And it, and we miss out on that if we neglect the meeting together of one another. And so, connected to this here, the whole encouraging one another, look what's attached to that there. But encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day, as you see the day drawing near. All the more as time goes on. Why? Because you're seeing that the day is drawing near. Now what's the day? The day is that day. You know what day I'm talking about. The day when Christ comes again. All the more we are to encourage it. So why aren't we to neglect the, ne- neglect the gathering of ourselves together in relation to, to specifically to what's here? Because we understand that the day is approaching. Not only that, we see that the day is approaching. Now you can look at this in a couple of ways. In one sense, we understand from a, you know, just in, in, a, in a general perspective that we're always closer to that time than when we were before. That's what, that's what uh, Paul says in Romans chapter 13. We are closer to our salvation now than when we first believed. So that one fact alone, you know, is something that, should, that we should be grounded in. We're, how close are we to, uh, to the second coming of Christ? I don't know. It could be tomorrow, could be next month, it could be in another thousand years. But whatever the case, we're closer every time we keep going. Each day that passes, each minute, each hour, we are closer now to that, that time when Christ comes back. But we see it in another way as well. And this might speak specifically to the, to the particular situation that even the Hebrews were going through. Because the Hebrews were being, dis- were, were, it, again, the, the environment in which they existed could, re, could, could really produce a lot of discouragement because they were ones who had been told about the, about the coming of Christ and they were probably told, you know, yeah, it could, happen, it could happen at any moment, which is true. And it's even true now. It can happen at any moment. Um, but, you know, but then as the heat gets turned up more and more and more, persecution, everything like that, it's just kind of like, man, what, you know, I'm looking, I'm looking for, I found this new life in Christ. I'm looking for the coming of, of the Messiah. Um, I missed it the first time. These are a group of people who they, you know, they learned about Christ for the first time at a, at a previous time. Didn't really know that Jesus was the Messiah before then. They missed out on, the, on him the first time. And they're thinking, well, is he, is he actually coming back a second time? There's just so much stuff that I'm having to deal with right now. And so when we meet together, we... we we, we remind ourselves ab- about the reality, the truth and the reality that Jesus Christ, despite what's happening right now, is coming. In fact, 
it's because of the things that are happening right now that points all the more to the fact and the reality that, those, that, that Jesus Christ is certain to come. That's why I look at something like the Olivet Discourse and I see the birth pains and everything like that. I don't believe that that's, that that's Jesus telling what's going to happen in the seven-year tribulation period. You see some of those things unfolding in the book of Acts. What Jesus is telling his disciples is that these are the things that have to happen before the end. And I'm telling you these things ahead of time so that you can be encouraged. You, can, you, know, you, you know these things ahead of time so that when these things come your way, you're not discouraged. And I think how it's, how it's mentioned in Luke is that so you don't fall into dissipation out of discouragement and everything because of everything that's happening around you. You know? And so there's, because, so when we see what we see and use your imagination on what those things are, whether we're talking about coronavirus, where we're talking about political overreach, whether we're talking about transgenderism taking over our schools, where we're talking, whatever the case may be, you know, there, there are times when things are just so in your face, then there's a low. Comes back in fuller force, then... Those are birth pains. Jesus, Jesus warned. He said, this, this, is, this is what's going to happen. These things will happen, but the end is not yet. But if we recognize those things as, as I believe that Jesus was, was communicating to his disciples, things that you see that serve as an indication of the reality and the truthfulness of when he's going to come again in victory, you know, if we see it through that light, we can come together as a group and even though there is so much crud out there, we can encourage one another and say, aren't you glad that this isn't all that there is to it? That, there, that we have a Savior who has won, and guess what? We're on the winning side. Just having it termed that way is always an encouragement to me. We're on the winning side, right? And so we can, and no wonder, no wonder, Paul says, and let's encourage one another with these words. I wasn't just saying those things to say things. He had a purpose behind it. It was to, it's so, so that we can continually be reminded of, of, that, of that reality, which, by the way, the second coming of Christ is very much tied. It's not an addendum to what we understand to be the gospel. That is the gospel. That's a big feature of the gospel. And what we have here in verse 19, those, in those verses that I didn't read, that, that, I didn't, that I read but didn't go into detail on, that's the gospel. So everything that we're talking about here is, is firmly grounded in the reality of the gospel. And when we are firmly grounded in the gospel, we're in a good op- we have a good chance and a good opportunity to come together and encourage one another, whatever that might look like, whether knowingly or unknowingly, and encourage one another so that when we walk out of here, we're reminded, you know what, everything out there, and even with things personally that's going on in my life that might not be too good, it's not all that there is. It's not the end of the story. God is in my midst right now. He loves me, has a plan, he has a purpose for me, and he has an ultimate purpose for whenever he comes back, whenever that will be. And we can encourage one another with those, with those words. Now, I just want to say one other thing before we bring this to a close here. Um, I mentioned before, you know, this whole thing of, of one another, and how the assembling together of ourselves is the opportunity that we have to, uh, to really speak into one another's lives and, and to be an encouragement with one another, which again indicates that we're dealing with something that's more than just a service. I remember a while back, and I think I had mentioned this a while back on my podcast, um, I, I had said, you know what, I would love to at some point Whenever I'm talking to other Christians or something, maybe people outside of my own, you know, uh, church congregation, ask them, what, what, uh, what church do you, do you minister at? Because really that's what it is. We're all ministers, right? According to Ephesians 4, maybe not vocationally, but we're all ministers. And in the ways that we talked about now, when we minister to other people as we do, that's us being ministers to other people. So when we come together, you know, one of the things I want to ask people is that what, what church do you minister at? Or what church do you minister to? Is it more appropriately? Now, I, I realize that that might throw people for a loop because that's not, 
that's not how we're used to seeing things. They might say, well, I, I, well, I go to or I worship at, you know, whatever, you know, church, you know, whatever. Um, but really, and, and, here's, and here's the other thing, because you, you say that, we say that, you know, when you minister to somebody, again, I, I, you know, the, the, the thought that we might have in our minds is that we say minister, we think of a ministry. And we think of a ministry, we think of something that's organized, that has a committee, that has the, a, a chairman or a chairwoman or, or whatever the case, and it's, you know, that's a ministry. It's, it's got to be something where it's a committee, you have meetings or something like that. And you can have that. I'm not saying that there aren't ministries that aren't like that. But ministry is just a matter of ministering to other people in the, in the smallest ways. So, yes, you are a minister. So I can rightly ask somebody, what church do you minister to? And, and you know, they could say, yeah, they can still say the whatever church that they go to. But one of the things that I hope that they get from that interaction is saying that, look, it's not a matter of everything being given to you, you know, where you're being ministered to. That's what I do. I come to and I minister to, you know, because, you know when, I, when I come and I attend the service. And sometimes a lot of the services are designed that way. You know, and again, I, I'm not saying that there's necessarily anything wrong with that. It just depends on the situation. But you realize that a lot of the things in services are set up for the benefit of other people so that they can, they can feel more comfortable. Ambiance, instruments, you know, all those sorts of things. And so people say, I feel ministered to. And sometimes that's, that's to a fault. Uh, you know, it, but, you know, it, it, but really, at, at the end of the day, outside of the service, there's that potential. And sometimes, not even just the potential, the thing that actually happens where we minister to one another. And that's what I hope that you and I and even other Christians outside of here, how they see themselves as ministers and how they see themselves in relation to their church as this is where I minister and this is who I minister to because that's how it's truly meant to be. That's how God designed it. And that's why we aren't to neglect the meeting together of one another. So with that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, truth of the matter is I could go on and on um, and there's a great temptation <laughs> there's a great temptation to go on and on um, but hopefully Lord just by your spirit it, the, the, the message has been given and I thank you for what you've taught me and what you've reminded me of even as it relates to preparing for this message that I give to your people and I thank you so much that we have this opportunity and even though that there are challenges I had just as far as, you know, with other churches meeting or not meeting and everything like that. I pray that you would instill in all of our hearts this reality that we're involved in something that's more than just a service, that we can, that we can really um, uh, be used of you as church continues to really be able to encourage and to speak love and life into other people. And so I pray that, 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 would, that we would be conscious of that every time we come into this gathering, Lord and that we would be open to being used by you uh, to serve one another, to, to speak encouragement to one another. Um, and may it all be for your glory, Lord, because that's ultimately what we really want. So we just thank you for this time. Uh, we thank you for this service. Uh, as I said, Lord, nothing wrong with the service, Lord. I just, and, but I thank you for this because we believe that when we come together and we worship you in this service, that we are lifting up our praise, honor, and glory to you. Um, as you are as you're well deserving of it and I just pray that everything that we've done this morning um, will be for your joy and for your glory that you're pleased with our worship and that you'll be pleased with our worship in our lives as we leave this place and minister to other people even outside of this time so again Lord we thank you for everything that you've done for us this morning we pray this in Jesus name Amen